The Romance of the Ranchos. Rancho La Brea, 1769. Portola Expedition finds great tar pits. Rancho La Brea, 1866. Surveyor wins fight for Rancho in Supreme Court. Rancho La Brea, 1902. Ancient relics found in La Brea pits. Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos, a weekly dramatization of the historic events which make our Southern California so colorful and romantic. Each week, our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, returns to tell a true story of the days of the dawn. We have been fighting the Japanese for less than five months. The Chinese have been fighting them for almost five years. America is helping the Chinese government. The American people must help the Chinese people. Send your contribution today to United China Relief, Los Angeles. Title Insurance and Trust Company heartily endorses United China Relief, which will appreciate even a small contribution to aid two million war orphans and 50 million refugees in China. And to prevent there ever being 50 million refugees in this country, buy war savings bonds and stamps as often as you can. And here to tell us the story is our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham. Buenas noches, senoras y señores. Our story tonight deals with perhaps one of the most interesting of all the Southern California ranchos, the Rancho La Brea. It is interesting not only for the fascinating things revealed there, but for the family who have been most closely identified with it, the Hancock family. This is a story steeped in the romance of the ranchos. <laughs> Our story tonight is unusual, for it has its beginnings in the dim forests of another age, long before the first recorded history of our world. But the first white men to see the Rancho La Brea knew nothing of that beginning. They were the soldiers and missionaries of the party headed by Captain Gaspar de Portola, soldier of Spain and explorer extraordinary. He'd set out from Mexico with a small party for the purpose of finding suitable sites for the establishment of missions in the wilderness of Alta California. And as they journeyed through the valleys of Southern California, marveling at all its wonders, they stopped to camp at a spring in a broad marshy valley. And no sooner had they dismounted from their horses than... Caramba! Madre de Dios! There it is again! Hola, hombres! It's all right. It's finished. With just a little one, no need to worry. The capitán, let us not stay in this land any longer. We can help. I don't like this. Every few minutes, when the very ground begins to heave so uh, and Pedro, so. calm yourself. They are just little earthquakes. They can do no harm. Maybe no, maybe see. There's so many of them. See, si, but they are little. They can do no harm. But soon there may be a big one and the earth may open up and swallow us whole. Pedro, you are dreaming. Stop thinking of such things. Nothing is going to happen. I'm not so sure. No, neither are the men. They do not like it. They say this is a bad land. Ah, uh, just because of a few little shakes. They say there must be something here that causes it. Volcanoes or something. Perhaps there are some in the mountains, but that need not worry us here. But we are far from the mountain. See, si, but... Now, the... Pedro, come. You must forget such fears. You are neglecting the preparations for our camp. See, si, see, si, I had almost forgotten. Come, bring your water pail. We shall go down and look over the spring. See, si, very well. Make the camp ready, hombres. Yes. We will bring water. Now, Pedro, come and forget the earthquake. See. Si. There. Ah, that look refreshing, eh? After a hot, dusty trip, a cool drink of water with this fire. Yeah, and as for me, I'm going to have some right now. Come, stretch out with me, Capitan. <laughs> what is this? This water is warm, not cool. Yeah, hey, you are right. It is. Hmm. Well, no doubt because of the hot sun. And it is so shallow. Well, it does not matter. It will quench our thirst and... Madre Dios! What was that? Ramba. I don't know. 
sounded like a shot. But it came from over that direction. I do not like this. Oh, there must be some explanation. Now, let us go on through the underbrush here and see. Oh, Mother de Dios. Saints preserve us. Ah, look. Caramba. Mother sacra. What do you make of that? <laughs> Don't you see? It's a tar pit. The liquid pitch, it bubbles up with the water. It comes up out of the earth. Have you not seen a tar pit? No. Well, never. you see one now. The loud report we heard, it was the bubble of the pitch bursting. There. Watch. Ah. There goes another. What a Dios. Those loud reports of the bursting brea or pitch bubbles were heard for many years, echoing across the plains. But as the years passed, there were more ears to hear them. The Pueblo of Los Angeles was founded and grew, and the citizens found a use for the crude brea, which nature furnished so generously. After the bubble burst, great chunks of the crude asphalt were thrown out. These the villagers gathered up and carted to the Pueblo. There they laid them on the roofs and waited for the hot sun to complete the work. Later on, they were to use the brea for sidewalks as well as for roofing. And so the land on which La Brea Pit stood was a valuable asset to the Pueblo. The city fathers recognized that when, in 1828, the town blacksmith, a native of Portugal, by the name of Antonio Rocha, received happy news. Antonio! Antonio! See, si, see, si, what is it, Senor Alcalde? Stop that infernal noise and I will tell you. See, <clears throat> si, there it is stopped. This had better be something of importance. I am a very busy man. Don Antonio Mario Lugo is waiting for his branding iron. Never mind, amigo mio. This is important, all right. Yeah. You will not care whether you make another branding iron or not after you hear. Eh? What's the matter with you? What could be so important? A rancho, perhaps? Huh? A rancho? You... You mean... <laughs> you mean the rancho La Brea, which I have asked for? Well, perhaps. Madre de Dios. Oh, senor, don't joke with me. Come, come, come. Tell me if it is so. I have been granted permission to live on the Rancho La Brea. Si, sí, you have, amigo <laughs> mio. Oh. The Ayuntamiento has decided that you are a worthy citizen and a good Catholic. And so it is yours in spite of the fact that you are Portuguese. Oh, Don Jose. <laughs> How can I ever thank you? Oh, gracias, gracias. I shall do everything the law requires. I, I shall build a house, stock it with cattle. I, I'll do everything. You shall see that I will make a good ranchero. I have no doubt, Don Antonio. But wait, there is one condition to the grant. Eh? Eh, que paso? Un condition? See, si. On this land stand the pits of La Brea. These you may not own. They are reserved for the use of all the citizens of the Pueblo. You must not restrict their use. Mm. You and everybody may still take as much Brea as is needed for each man's use. See, si. for what would I want with more of it than I need anyway? <laughs> now I am a ranchero! <laughs> When the ranch was first granted to Rocha, the valuable tar pits were reserved as communal property. But later on, the Ayuntamiento were to give the rights to a private citizen, Carlos Barrick, who sold the brea, gave 5% to the Pueblo. But this practice had been discontinued by the time the Americans took over California, and when, in 1860, an American approached the widow of Antonio Rocha. You have seen the Rancho La Brea, Major Hancock? See, si, I have, Senora Rocha. In fact, I've surveyed all that section of land out there. <laughs> Tell me, is there any part of this country you have not surveyed, senor? <laughs> well, not very much, senora. But that's my job, county surveyor. See, si. uh, But tell me, you like the Rancho La Brea, hmm? Very much. Enough to want to make it my home. See, si, I am glad. But I must warn you, senor, I do not even know whether I can sell any of it. You see... The Land Commission has not allowed our claim. They say our grant was uh, invalid. Uh, I know that, Senora. They claimed that the land was within the limits of the Pueblo, and therefore your grant could only be provisional. See, si, that is what they said. But, uh, Senora, later the Land Commission decided that the limits of the Pueblo were smaller than they had supposed, so that changes the rancho, too. You mean... The rancho was not on Pueblo land? Exactly. It was outside by two leagues. 
So that means that your grant should uh, never have been questioned. And it is mine to sell to you? Yeah, as soon as the title can be cleared. See. And uh, I'll help you to clear the title. I'm prepared to offer my services to you as your counsel. But that is so kind of you. You are well known as an expert at such matters. Oh, no, it's not kind at all, Senora. It's selfish on my part. I want to live on this land. I want to buy it from you. And so it's to my interest to establish your right to sell it. Well, with you as my counsel, we cannot fail. I sincerely hope not. We'll fight it out to the Supreme Court if we have to. And Major Henry Hancock did have to fight the case to the Supreme Court to establish the Rocha claim to Rancho La Brea. Major Hancock pleaded the case himself in the district court, but when the Supreme Court brought it up, the famous surveyor had to turn the case over to his friend, Senator Cornelius Cole, who appeared before the High Court in Washington. And for his services in upholding the claim, Cole received a reward from Major Hancock, who now owned the rancho. Well, there she is, Major. What, Senator? <laughs> whoa there, whoa, whoa. You mean this is the property you want? Yep, that's it. From that line of trees up to the mountain. Yeah, but, Senator, you ought to know better than that. I give you your choice of land on the whole ranch, and you pick out some of the most useless land on the property. Well, why useless? <laughs> because almost any other part of the ranch is more fertile. Better farming land, better grazing land. What about better land for a town? A town? <laughs> Oh, no, Senator. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking this land might make a good spot for a new town. And you're going to start it? Maybe. Might start a little town called uh, Cool Grow. <laughs> That's my vanity coming to the fore. Senator, I won't let you do it. Why, you can make money on the land you buy, not throw it down a rat hole. Now, now wait a minute, Major. Our agreement was, if I handled the case before the Supreme Court, you'd give me a tenth part of this rancho. That part to be of my own choosing. Yeah? Well, this is the part I choose. And what I do with it was not in the agreement. So uh, I guess you'll have to let me be foolish and found Cold Grove. And a few years later, on the part of Rancho La Brea he chose, Senator Cole started the little village of Cold Grove, a village which is today a large part of Hollywood. But the rest of the rancho remained in the hands of Major Hancock and his family. And there they made their home. A foreshadowing of events to come was enacted one day when the Major talked with a friend. Glad you could come out today, George. I'll show you around the place as soon as I get rid of this. All right, Henry. What in the world is that? Oh, just a bone. A bone? Where in the world did you find it? It's mighty old. Probably is. We're digging out the asphalt from the old tar pits, and I found this buried. Oh, yeah, I've, I've heard about your tar pits. Natives around here call them uh, the boneyard. Yes, I know. <laughs> Cattle and horses got stuck in the tar, huh? Well, that seems to be the explanation. Well, and that's what you have there. A bone from some old cow. Maybe. But that's what puzzles me. I've never seen a cow bone just like this. I wish I knew more about them. I have a feeling there's something unusual about those tar pits. And although Henry Hancock was right, he didn't live to find out just how unusual his tar pits were. Nor did he live to witness another great discovery on his Rancho La Brea. His widow was living on the land when, in 1901, she received a visitor. You see, madam, the oil company that I represent has discovered oil east of here, toward town. We're pretty sure that we'll find it out here, too. So I've taken the liberty of poking around your land. That's quite all right, sir. Have you found anything interesting? Very interesting. For instance, those old tar pits are definite proof that there is oil on this land, and lots of it. The old tar pits? Why, there's tar there and asphalt. Oil, too? Yes. Because you see, madam, that tar and asphalt is actually crude oil. Or much the same thing. Tar and asphalt are byproducts of oil. Then you mean there actually is oil on this land? Millions of barrels. A well can be sunk almost anywhere on this ranch and bring up oil. Unless I miss my guess, your ranch will be a forest of oil derricks before long. But oil is valuable, isn't it? Valuable? <laughs> well, that's not the word for it, Mrs. Hancock. You're going to be a very wealthy woman. Now the Rancho La Brea was the scene for more feverish activity than it had seen in all its years of life. Squads of men worked over the grounds. Here, there, and everywhere, gaunt wooden scaffolding stretched toward the California sky. 
But after several unsuccessful attempts, Mrs. Hancock herself financed a well. And one day... What's that? Sounds like... Yeah, come on! There she is. Look at it. It's your well. They brought her in. You mean that shower of black water? Black water? Mrs. Hancock, that's oil. Oil, they've struck it. When you buy a home, you're said to acquire title to the property, and your right to possess and enjoy it is only as strong as the title itself. Now, that title involves not just yourself and the person from whom you bought. It goes back through the years to the time when your particular piece of property was first granted or sold to a private owner. In California, that generally means back to the days of an early rancho. Many sales and other transactions involving your property have taken place since then. Yet, if any one of them were faulty or illegal, your right to your home may be destroyed and your investment jeopardized. To protect that investment and to safeguard yourself against the possibility of expensive litigation, you can get a policy of title insurance from the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles. This title insurance is more than a printed document. It represents a whole series of services, of which the three most important are these. First, an exhaustive search by trained experts of all public records pertaining to your property from its earliest ownership. Second, an interpretation of the results of this search by men skilled in title examination work for many years. Third, an insurance policy guaranteeing the accuracy of this work and protecting you against loss due to any title defect covered by the policy. Considering the scope and value of these services, you'll be surprised to learn how small is the cost of title insurance on your property. <laughs> With the discovery of oil on Rancho La Brea, the modern development of that area began. Now the oil derricks have given way to the smart homes and apartments of present-day Hollywood and the Wilshire district. But now, let's go back through the years and learn the secret of Rancho La Brea. A secret we have hinted at. A secret which makes it the most fascinating of all the early ranchos. A secret which was kept for 50,000 years and revealed only 40 years ago. In 1902 it was. And in that year, Professor W.W. W. Orchid of the Union Oil Company's Geological Department was conducting an investigation at the tar pits. You know, Phillips, this is immensely interesting. Surely, sir. It was bound to be to an oil man. No, it's more than oil that interests me. What do you mean, sir? I'm speaking strictly as a geologist now, Phillips. There's some exciting indications around these pits. Promises of historic discoveries. Oh. Well, I suppose you geologists can find lots of old fossils and things of that sort all around here. Not like this. Uh, take those bones the workmen dug up. Oh, those old things. What are you going to learn from a pile of old cattle bones? Uh, never mind. Come on. Let's take a look. Oh, all right. You're the boss. But it's all pretty silly if you ask me. Oh, all right. Now, we'll see how silly it is. Now, here's the latest pile. I haven't looked them over yet, but, uh... Let's see what you find right now. Anybody who's lived around Los Angeles for more than six months can tell you what you'll find. A bunch of old cattle bones. This probably was a watering place back in the old days, and the cattle got stuck in the tar like quicksand. So? All right. Now, here's a bone. Obviously not a rib or a vertebrae, so it must be a leg joint. Obviously. But uh, I'll stand it up. Now, did you ever see a cow with a leg that big, let alone one bone of the leg? Well, no. I hadn't noticed that before. Yeah. But maybe they were bigger in those days. They were, but they weren't called cattle. In fact, they weren't called anything. No. Why not? Because there wasn't anybody here to call them anything. Doctor, what are you talking about? I'll explain. You see this? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Funny-looking bone. Yeah. Looks like a small elephant's tusk, almost. You're nearer right than you think. It's a tusk or tooth, all right, but not of an elephant. Oh, I understand now. It's a walrus tusk. What you mean is that this land was all underwater. No, that's not what I mean. Although it may have been at one time. Nor is this a walrus tusk. This is the saber of a saber-toothed tiger. Oh, yes, I've heard of them. Lived some time ago, didn't they? Some time ago? My friend, the saber-toothed tiger hasn't lived for a good many thousand years. You mean... You mean these are really fossils of these prehistoric animals? Not fossils, Phillips. This is even more important than that. These are real bones preserved in oil, just as we'd preserve them in alcohol. These are actual bones of the saber-toothed tiger and the giant mastodon that lived on this land over 50,000 years ago. The 
the bones of the great saber-toothed tiger. Here was a find of immense importance. At last, California was to learn something of the life which swarmed over the dank jungles which were the Southland of 500 centuries ago. And from those oil-soaked bones that were found in the La Brea pits, the scene of the Pleistocene Age was reconstructed. A fascinating, barbaric, terror-filled scene. Let us go back through the years for a moment and witness that scene. The mists of the time brush away. And now I see a great pool, submerged in a heavy arch of dense green foliage. A shimmering pool of tepid water, a few feet deep. In the surrounding jungle, scores of creeping, crawling, lizard-like creatures feed on the green leaves. From limb to limb of the giant plants leap others, equipped with bat-like wings. Everywhere there is life, slithering and squirming through the mud and heat. Suddenly, the placid calm is destroyed. The small animals dart for cover. The ground shakes with the footsteps of a moving mountain of hard-skinned flesh. Over the curtain of green leaves appears a great head with blinking red eyes searching for the water hole. Then, lumberingly, the towering figure of the mastodon crashes down the brush and plods to the edge of the water. Slowly, the huge animal drinks from the tepid water. Slowly, he moves into the water, toward the center of the pool, toward his doom. For there in the center of the water hole, bubbles are rising through the shallow water. Bubbles which mean that the floor of this pool is a bed of soft, sticky pitch. A death trap. Suddenly, the giant mastodon feels himself caught. Caught in a vice-like grip, sinking down, down into the depth. In spite of his desperate efforts, the treacherous pitch sucks him down. Down. Attracted by his cries, the jungle comes alive again. Suddenly, across the valley, thunders a terrible cry. <coughs> Chilling, awe-striking roar of the saber-toothed tiger, the bloodthirsty king of the jungle. Like a streak, the yellow monster with his great saber-like tusks bare races through the underbrush to the pool and with one flying leap, pounces on the back of the dying animal. Savagely, the tiger tears at the tough flesh. All around the jungle arena, scores of beady eyes peer on the savage spectacle as their owners stand hidden in the foliage, poised for instant flight. High above the forest pool hover great sharp-billed vultures, their bat wings spread, their talons poised to join in the kill. Suddenly, the tiger slips, plunges into the treacherous liquid. And now, the victor is caught in a deadly grip, struggling beside the lifeless body of his victim. Quickly, the vultures dive. The wolves leap from the underbrush, all fighting for the flesh of the helpless animals. But they're not wary enough. Here, a wing is dipped too low. A splash, and the vulture is caught. Now, a wolf, tearing too greedily, slips into the waiting trap. But the others feast until the pool runs red. Blood. The sun sinks low. The evening shadows creep over the weird scene. The great twisted masses of lifeless flesh and bone sink down. Down into the dark depth. Down out of sight. In the hardening tissues of the earth, they find a final resting place. A resting place to be undisturbed for 500 centuries. And now the primeval forest is quiet. Except for the perpetual bubble of the La Brea pits. Such a savage, barbaric tragedy may well have taken place in our Southland 50,000 years ago. Yet there was some degree of immortality in that death of the monsters. For as the ages passed and the earth underwent many changes, their species was wiped out, all trace of them obliterated from the earth. Only these few, 
Their bones preserved in the oily brea remain to tell modern science what manner of life roamed our Southland so many thousands of years ago. You may see those bones today in the Museum of Art and Science at Exposition Park in Los Angeles. And you may visit that lonely jungle pool in Hancock Park at Wilshire Boulevard near Fairfax in the heart of a great modern city. It was made a gift to the city by Captain Alan Hancock, Major Henry's son, in 1913. And there, surrounded by chrome and glass and neon, you may still recapture some of the thrilling grandeur of that savage, barbaric scene. Such is the romance of the ranchos. Frank Graham will be back in a moment to tell you about next week's story. As its name clearly indicates, the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles has a trust department as well as a title department. In fact, Title Insurance and Trust Company is the oldest trust company in the Pacific Southwest, having served this community since 1901. A primary function of the trust department is the conservation of accumulated estates. The first step in conservation is avoidance of unnecessary shrinkage from taxes, probate, or other expenses. Without obligation, capable, experienced officers of the estate planning division will work with you and your attorney in developing a plan for your estate, which may benefit both you and your family. You're invited to write or call for information about this and other important services available to you at Title Insurance and Trust Company. Now, Frank, what's the story for next week? Next week, we're going to trace the fascinating history of our own Pueblo de Nuestra Señora La Reina de Los Angeles, the early history of the world's most amazing city. I know you'll want to hear it. So until next week, this is your wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, saying, Hasta la vista, señoras y señores. <laughs> The Romance of the Ranchos, a presentation of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, featuring Frank Graham as the wandering vaquero, is dramatized by John Dunkel and produced by Ted Bliss, with special music arranged by Gaylord Carter. Bob Lamont saying good night. <laughs> This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.